Well, in the last um, a couple lessons, we talked about, we, we introduced everything with the people, with, with the Bible, with the Old Testament, with the land. And uh, then we talked about prehistory, we talked about Job, we talked about Genesis. Um, and, and so now that takes us to the fence uh, between Exodus and Ruth, which sounds like a lot, but it is actually only about like 400 years or so. I mean, really not that much. Um, so... <clears throat> okay, so Israel leaves Egypt sometime around either 1400 or 1200. Um, it really depends what you how you understand this. Um, <clears throat> they are given the law at Sinai. They they have they wander in the desert for 40 years. Moses writes Genesis and Deuteronomy before they before he dies, and then Joshua leads the, the people into into the conquest of the land, which as recorded in the book of Joshua. Which takes us to the time of the Judges, which is either between 1300 to 1050 or 1030, so, or it could have been could have been later. Um, it, it's kind of hard to hard to guess. Um, ju the event, the Judges ruled simultaneously sometimes, and there'd be sometimes without Judges, and just hard to hard to date. It really doesn't give specifics because once again, it's not trying to give a historical account so much so much as just trying to um, establish what was going on. Um, uh, for the people. So, uh, and then the events of, of Ruth happened during the time of the judges. Uh, it mentions that. So you have all these books, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, uh, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, and Ruth, all happening in this in this, in this outline here. Um, <clears throat> so, I personally lean towards the 1400 state um, just because um, it gives the, the judges a little bit more time to work out and Different reasons um, like that. Uh, ultimately, though, I could easily be swayed to the 1200 date um, or a new date all in, in total. I mean, I, it's very hard to hard to get specifically. So here are some different ideas on the Exodus route. Um, you can see here in purple where they went up here, around here, and then whoop, down here, and down here, and up here to Kadesh Barnea, down here to Edson Gibber, and then up here. Around here, and then finally to uh, Tashvan in that area, Jericho and all that. And here's another here's another idea that's been posed as either this way here or this way here. You can see this one here, the first way, um, which is a little bit less likely. This is the the purple one is the more traditional route. Um, once again, where where do you say Mount Sinai is? Um, as this one, this is the traditional route completely. In this, they didn't go up here. They went down here. Now, I personally like the idea of them going up here because it says uh, about how Pharaoh saw them and saw that they were just wandering out in the wilderness. Um, it, that, th that really fits nicely with them coming up here. But once again, it would make more sense, and it's the traditional view that they came down this way. Uh, the quail and the manna was somewhere around here. Whoops. Um, Mount Sinai is, is probably down here, according to this this view. Um, they get up here, and the twelve spies go in, and they want to spend forty years doing pretty much nothing, and then go to Jericho. Um, so there there are different different views there. Um, I'm not really set on any of them. Um, once again, things that don't really matter, I try to not stress too much. But basically, Exodus picks up and it skips over 400 years, of, about somewhere in there, of slavery. Um, it's a little bit unclear as to the exact dating of this, but it seems most natural to say there's 400 years that they actually spent in slavery. So um, this was during the New Kingdom of Egypt. Now what happened was the Hyksos came came in and took over Egypt uh, in a large part, and then what, with the New Kingdom, the Pharaoh came back up and kicked them out and reunified Egypt. Now as a result, they're going to really, really be skeptical of um, people not skeptical, but um, fearful, I guess you could say, of outsiders. And so it, it would be very natural for them to um, put the Israelites into slavery because they were outsiders. And, they, you know, the Hyksos didn't just one day take over. They slowly came in and then took over. And so the Egyptians could easily have said, you know, this is going to be the exact same nonsense again. Um, 
See, the, the later date of 1200 gives a lot more time for that slavery issue to go on, but uh, once again, it's very hard to date things. You know, you can give figures and, and estimates of dates, but you really can't get things down perfectly. So the New Kingdom of Egypt was from about 1550 to about 1100, somewhere in there. Um, so uh, with that, we, we, go to, we go to Moses. After these 400 years, we, we go to a completely different person here. Um, first off, uh, he's saved by, by something that he has no control over in verses uh, 22 through chapter 2, verse 6. Um, then Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you, born you are to, um, to cast into the Nile, and every daughter you are to keep alive. Uh, basically um, preventing the Israelites from multiplying anymore. Um, now this this story strongly relates with the story um, called the Autobiography of Sargon, uh, Sargon the Great, if you've um, heard of him. Um, they usually teach about him in high school um, um, history. Uh, but it says, Sargon, strong king, king of a god, am I. My mother was a high priestess, my father I do not know. My paternal kin inhabit the mountain region, my city of birth is as a, Perino, as a Piranu, which lies on the bank of the Euphrates. My mother, a high priestess, conceived me in secret, she bore me. She placed me in a reed basket with uh, uh, bitumen, I guess, I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, she cocked my hatch. She abandoned me to, she abandoned me to the river from which I, I could not escape. The river carried me along to Aki, the water drawer it brought me. Aki, the water drawer, when immersing his bucket, lifted me up. Aki, the water drawer, raising me as his adopted son. Aki, the water drawer, sent me to his garden work. During my garden work, Ishtar loved me so that 55 years I ruled as king. Now, um, people will say, wow, that sounds a lot like Moses. It's very likely that Moses' mother had heard the story being Semitic and uh, that she tried to follow in the steps hoping that maybe something would happen. And then the, the Pharaoh's daughter could easily have been a, a Semitic as well because Pharaoh's – it was kind of the Pharaoh's thing to take wives in but not to give them out. Um, so, um, once again, you married into the Egyptian household by giving your daughter away, pretty much. Um, and, and so it is very likely that this Pharaoh's daughter was, um, did hear up and grow up hearing Semitic stories. If she was not of Semitic origin, she still could have heard the Semitic stories because, once again, there were a lot of Semitic people. So, um, I do hope I'm using that word Semitic correctly. Um, so uh, that takes us to his exile. He, he, he has this, obviously this passion for his people, and he tries to do what's right uh, in his eyes. Um, but once again, you know, taking things in his own hands, and, and as a result, he, he flees to, uh, to Midian. Um, now from that, um, God raises him up into, I guess you could say, a prophet, you know. Um, he's out there, you know, telling them what was going to happen, all this different stuff, and obviously he's not really heeded that much. But then in chapter 15, we see a, a, him put on a different, a different mask altogether, and he becomes the leader of a people, of a, of a new people, a people who had not been a people before, um, and now were. Um, now uh, Exodus can be broken down uh, accordingly: um, oppression, deliverance of Israel in chapters 1 through 15; a journey to Sinai in chapter 15 through 19. Uh, 192, I should say. Uh, the covenant is given at Sinai from 193 to 24 through 18, and they're still at Mount Sinai when the instructions for the sanctuary begin in 2532. Apostasy and, and apostasy and intercession is in chapter 32 through 33, um, with them um, making the making the images, and then in chapter 34 they get the new tablets and then building the sanctuary in 35 all the way through to the end. Now, how Exodus, let me break down a few things. First off, how Exodus ends is increasingly important as it's going to be a resounding theme in the book of Ezekiel. Um, when it talks about the glory coming, whereas Ezekiel is going to talk about the glory departing. Um, and, and, and so after the, the tabernacle is done, it keeps saying about how they, they built it exactly like God said, exactly how God said, exactly how God said. And then it says at the end, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So you just have this image of God guiding them and them, them obeying and then God blessing their work. Now about the the idols that they made while Moses was on the on the, on the mountain, um, it's uh, some have said they were conforming God to their image. It is very likely that 
they were trying to do something good, for lack of a better word, um, in that you know um, people have people have kind of expanded on this side. I really don't want to that much, but um, it, it is possible that that you know. Um, they, it wasn't like it seems. I know in today's culture we say, okay, so they were trying to say that, um, trying to make new gods, but it is also possible that they understood that that was what God was or looked like. It, it, once again, there are other people who have taken this farther and, and who explain things, um, and I don't really want to get too much into it, but basically what it comes down to is they were conforming God to their image. Abraham, after he builds this... Uh, um, Sorry, not Abraham. Uh, Aaron, after he builds the, the idol, so, says, um, And behold, the God who took you out of Israel. And so it seems as though they may not have been worshipping another God, is assuming that they were worshipping Yahweh. Uh, not to excuse what they did, it's still bad, but maybe we don't understand it quite like it is. So just, I'm just going to throw that out there. Uh, if you want to do more study on that, you know, uh, go right for it. I'm, I'm not going to really touch on that very much um, as I don't want to cause more confusion than anything. If you're interested, you know, do more research on that. If you're not, then, you know, don't. <laughs> um, so then that takes us to, to the only time that God really gives us his name, per se. Um, I don't really want to get too much into that, but it he gives the name, um, say, I... Well, it, it basically what it is is what translates here is Y H W H. We'll call the tetragrammaton or gammaton, um, and people have surmised that it's the verb to be. I am, basically, I am who I am, or I am who I will be, or 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 basically, I, I am self-existent. I am creator, unchanging, eternal, faithful. Just kind of these ideas with it. Um, also, some other people have assumed that way meant uh, I am, meaning uh, I am fill in the blank, healer, savior, etc. Um, it's kind of un, un, unsure, um, and I wouldn't uh, share things, uh, take things too far on this. But what I would like to affirm is that God, I know there's there's this view going around that God, uh, people say that God meant for his name to be breathed. Um, there is no biblical basis for this. This is, this is a misunderstanding from the Hebrew, basically. Um, and I don't really want to elaborate on that too much. Um, I've kind of already talked about that. Um, so I think I'll go ahead and leave that where it lies. Um, so uh, Moses, however, ha has this disobedience um, in four in chapter four twenty two through twenty six. So I said to you, let my son go that he may serve me, but you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Now it came about at the lodging place on the way that the Lord met him and sought uh, to put him to death. Then Sipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and threw uh, it at Moses' feet. Moses' feet. And she said, You are indeed a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. At that time she said, You are a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Now, it's important to note a few things. First off, sonship is a theme here talks about Egypt's son, God's son, and then Moses' son. Moses' son. Um, so you can see that. But then also, um, it's important to remember that Moses is is guilty of, of murder, and he still has not, remember, he murdered the Egyptian, and he still has not um, has not participated in the circumcision that God commanded Moses' forefather. Um, so once again, Moses is saved by someone else. His mom, Pharaoh's daughter, you know, his sister, whatever, uh, and here his wife, you know, we see Moses continually being saved by someone else. Um, so it's it's most it, it's best to see that what that passage is talking about was with God, with Moses' disobedience, that he did not circumcise his son, um, and that God demands his leaders uh, do are are held to a standard, especially if he's going to use them to lead other people. Um, I, I know a lot of people have made super made this super spiritual and not. I would highly encourage you to not do such a thing. Um, so that takes us to the uh, to the um, the the what are they called the um, the plagues the plagues of Egypt. Now with that. Um, th there's a few th there's a few things. First off, is, is the Nile was kind of seen as a source of life. 
Uh, the Pharaoh is oftentimes throughout history seen of seen as a god, a son of a god, those kinds of things. Uh, the sun was seen as a god who who does his travel throughout the day and then fights the under through the underworld at night. Um, and then the frogs were seen as holy to Osiris. Um, these are just a few of the things. So surely it is possible that the that the plagues of Egypt were meant to teach who the real god was and that he was in control over these other gods. Um, but once again, there are some things in, in the place that we really can't find any connection to Egypt with, so maybe this is just coincidence. I'll let you decide for yourself. Um, however, um, either way, it is important that God established that he was God, that God established that the people were his people and that he ultimately had control over them, and that even though Egypt denied him, that he was still in control over them as well. So the other gods of the Egyptian pantheon could partially repeat, but none of them could, none of them could reverse the effects. That's not really that beneficial to be able to make a curse worse. Um, uh, and once again, they couldn't repeat all of the all the different things. So that takes us to the Passover in chapter 12, um, where um, where they are, you know, uh, they're they're basically celebrating their their um, release from capti captivity. Um, and as I mentioned before, Exodus is really about God saving people by His grace that could not save themselves. So this strongly mirrors salvation, um, in which I come to this. It is very important that Christians no longer celebrate Passover because the Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, has already been sacrificed. We're no longer looking forward to something. And we're not really celebrating something that happened anymore because, once again, we're not Jewish and, you know, um, we're not told to continue any of those, any of those uh, Jewish festivals. So it's important that as Christians we don't proclaim the coming Messiah when he's already come. Um, <clears throat> but uh, they were told to do this. The people of Israel were told to do this um, to, as, a or as a reminder of how God had set them free. So that takes us through the Passover. There. Um, it also seems as though Moses saw the heavenly tabernacle, the dwelling place, because you know he did, he did make a, a, a skull replica of it. Or not skull replica. I'm sorry. He did make a, a. He did guide the people in making it. Um, but what we see is God is not left at Sinai. He is with them. He 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 leaves with them from from Sinai. He's not the God of the mountain. He's not the God of this or that. He's the God of everywhere. He's going with them. Um, once again, contrasting strongly with the other other uh, beliefs of the area. So some themes of Exodus: a deliverance that God's grace was supreme and that He saved. Um, and not, um, not them. Uh, two, uh, the covenant, um, that there was a response that was very much so uh, necessary from God's people. You know, God had God had saved them, and it demanded a, a, a response. God had made made a covenant with them, and because of that, they were expected to live differently. Um, and we also see the presence of God and the consequences of the presence of God. For the Egyptians, it was bad. For the Israelites, it was good. So which side of you know God are you? The same this, the fire can be good or bad. You know it really just depends which which side you are on. Um, so Israel becomes a holy nation, a, a nation of, of of what was supposed to be um, a priestly nation uh, as a witness to the to the other people, but obviously you know they followed the people instead. Um, and people ask, why was there not a sign of the people left on the left on, on the land of Goshen? Why is there why can we not find evidence of the uh, of the slaves being there? Well, that's very obvious. First off, there's a long time ago. Second off, it was um, their 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 homes were, were made. They were, they were crap heaps. They were, they were mud you know, crap heaps. If not um, uh, partial tents. You know, it's it doesn't really elaborate too much, but basically it implies that they, you know they didn't live in palaces or anything. Um, and then the land of Goshen does flood often, so if they were made out of mud, they could have easily been done away with. If they were, you know, at least partly tense, if that's a theory you want to roll with, um, that really doesn't make sense either because they would have taken the tents with them when they left. So either way, however you want to look at it, you know. Um, this is this is a, a, an artist rendering I, I pulled off the internet of what somebody thought that it would look like 
I mean, it looked like for, for the tri tribes. You've got the Ark of the Covenant in the middle and, and the three tribes on each side, three, 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 and three, making 12. Um, so... And then here we have the tabernacle complex. Once again, I just found out the internet. You have the outer courts here. You have the bronze altar, the bronze laver, the table of showbread, and the seven-branched lampstand here in the holy place with the altar of incense. Now, in here is the Holy of Holies with the Ark of the Covenant. And it is the – they could only enter once a year, um, and only the high priest could. Um, so here's the courtyard, the holy place, and the Holy of Holies. So I know in, in church circles there's that song, Take Me In, you know, past the past the you know uh, i forget all the different things how it says it now but it basically is talking about this um i want to see your face it's talking about taking me into the holy voice uh, by the mercy seat um so anyways which which takes us to leviticus and some people think that exodus is kind of let me so sorry leviticus is kind of out of place but i would i would argue against that exodus ends with this kind of almost legal material almost and and the construction of 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 the tabernacle. And then Leviticus just kind of continues that theme and talking about, okay, now now I'm not going to tell you where to worship. I'm going to tell you how to worship. You know, Exodus kind of showed us a tabernacle, and that was kind of the highlight of that. Um, and, but with Leviticus, it's more of um, how God wanted him to, his people to, to worship him. Um, and I'll have another lesson specifically devoted to understanding the law and how it applies to us. Um, so I'm just going to kind of skip that for now. Um, don't want to waste too much time there. Um, uh, so the, it's named for the Levites, which is the tribe of Levi, the, the priests. Um, not to say that they're the only ones who are who the book concerns, but um, that they are the priests. Um, and in Leviticus, we see God's way of life. You know um, that you know that his his tabernacle was holy and it had to be dealt with in a certain way. Um, but what we see is that in Leviticus, we don't see anything that saves the people. We see things that are a result of this salvation. They were already out of Israel. They couldn't be any more out of Israel. Think of it like that. It's the same thing with salvation. God had already done, done the work. Now what he, what he demanded was um, for, for, their, uh, for their lives to match up. Um, basically, faith looking, faith looking forward is a good way to say it. Um, but yeah, um, they, they, they looked forward to Christ. The same as we look back to Christ, they looked forward to Christ. Um, and so did there, did the things give them salvation? No. The things uh, helped them uh, be in good relationship with the Lord. So I'll, I'll explain that more, uh, how that is at all different um, in, in a future lesson. Um, but... <clears throat> Uh, 18, 1 through 5 says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do what is done in the land of Egypt where you lived, nor are you to do what is done in the land of Canaan where I am uh, bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You are to perform my judgments and keep my statutes to live in accord with them, and I am, I am the Lord your God. So you shall keep my statutes and my judgments by which a man may live if he does them, I am the Lord. And then again in 19, 1 through 4, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Um, once again, you can just see this resounding theme about, you know, God is God, so do things his way. This is a consistently resounding theme. Um, so that takes us to an outline of, of Leviticus. You know, Christians can't live their own way either. You know, it's, it, the things from Leviticus still do apply to us, at least in principle. Not in teaching, but principle. Um, because once again, the, the Jesus' uh, blood was enough. That was offered all, uh, once for all. So, and he's our, our high priest, which Hebrews talks about. So, anyways, in chapters 1 through 7, talks about the offerings. 8 through 10 talks about the priesthood. 11 through 16 talks about the the uh, the uh, the cleanness and the uncleanness. Okay, which takes us to the holiness code in 17 through 26. Uh, basically, talks about uh, means of, means of living. Now, some themes from the book. And yes, Leviticus does only have uh, 27. Um, 27 chapters. I don't know why, but 26. But um, so some, some some themes there. The first is the law: how to love God and man. 
the two is is sacrifice. The wages of sin is death, and um, the animals died um, not to remove the sin, but in place of their sin. Okay, only Christ would would later remove the sin. Um, uh, and so that was necessary because that it does the wages of death. God's wrath is set against against sin. Um, so, anyways, uh, so then the, the third theme there is holiness. It is from God. And it is a lifestyle. Um, it is not from man. Um, it, they they did these things in obedience, but ultimately it was God who who made the things um, beneficial. I guess you could say. So the book of Numbers then is next. I know I'm blowing through this, and that's because I'm going to touch on it later, so I figured, why waste the time? Um, the people, it's not like the people messed up, and as a result, they were doomed to spend 40 years in the wilderness. The people had an attitude of rebellion. Um, and, I mean, every chance they got, they rebelled. They, they never set their minds to following the Lord. 14, 1-4 says, um, All the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. All the whole con uh, congregation said to them, would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become, will become a plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they want to go back to Egypt. And it's funny because their children, who they were so afraid of, of becoming you know, slaughtered or whatever, um, are actually the ones who end up uh, getting the land. So... Uh, 21, uh, 6 through 10, and, and it continues this line of thinking. Um, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. See, the people had this had this this attitude of faithlessness, which is a condition of humanity, which just repeats itself. Um, you know, and, and so the people had an attitude. It's not like they messed up and they they lost it. Like a lot of Christians are paranoid that they're going to lose their salvation somehow. Like it's some fickle thing and that can be just be lost at, at whim. Um, and then and so it's really there was an attitude problem. There was a heart problem. Um, it, it's it's interesting because all this time they've been building up this promise, and here's the people of Abraham, the descendants, and 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 finally they're at the land and everything's going good. And but reaching the promise, they fell. Reaching their promise, finally, after all these years, they don't even want to go in. At this, the readers, the readers should be thinking, originally, it was supposed to be thinking, what? What? But yet, throughout all this, we see God persistently guiding. We see God and God not giving up on the people. Even even when he, we, when he punishes them, he still keeps them preserved for the 40 years. And so they still able to live out their lives. He could have just struck them all dead and have the kids raise themselves up. You know, but he doesn't. He didn't do this. Um, he persistently guided, and he knew that they were going to mess up, and he still gave them the chance to follow him. Still um, gave them uh, salvation and, and gave them guidance. Um, very interesting how how God knew this was going to happen. He, this is how He chose to act. Um, so uh, faith then equals obedience. Faith does not does not equal salvation. You are not saved by your faith. I'm sorry. You are not saved by your works. You are saved by faith in God. <laughs> I said that backwards. Um, so, so the faith there leads to obedience, which is kind of what James talks about. Um, faith will always lead to obedience. Um, um, in 28 through, 8 through 12... And take the rod, and you and your brother Aaron assemble the congregation, and speak to the rock before their eyes that it may yield its water. You shall thus bring forth water um, for them out of the rock, and let the congregation and their, and their beasts drink. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord, just as he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock, and he said to them, Listen now, you rebels, shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice with the rod. And water came forth abundantly, and the congregation and their beasts drank. There's a few things to notice here. First, he spoke when he was... I'm sorry, he, he, he did a few things. Hold on, let me, let me back up here. I'm, I'm saying this wrong. God said to take the rod and to go into the congregation and speak to the rock before their eyes. He spoke to the people. Next... He struck the rock rather than speaking to the rock. So he messed up in both those things. Next, it seems as though Moses stole a miracle from God. Because there, there are rocks in the area with 
I'll let someone else who's smarter explain this further. But uh, basically, uh, what it comes down to is, is the water makes this makes this deposit over the rock, and if you hit the rock, the water will come and come out. And anybody who's been in the area would know that. Um, and and so with that being said, you know, with, without kind of just blowing past the idea, it is possible that Moses saw that this was one of those rocks, struck it, and the water came out and stole. He stole that miracle from God rather than speaking to it and God opening up the rock. So, um, once again, though, that, that is speculation. I don't really want to spend too much time on that, because I don't really like to waste time on speculation, but it is a possibility. Um, Hebrews really does discuss a lot about what's going on here. In 3, 7 through 12, uh, it says, Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for forty years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, They always go astray in their heart, and they did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Um, so anyways, uh, people may say, Okay, well, well, that's stupid. People wouldn't do that nowadays. But don't we? What about the problem of AIDS? If people would just stop... For a couple generations, AIDS would die off, um, but yet people want to continue in sin and not experience consequences. Now, I know not everybody who has AIDS, um, you know, is is living a sinful life. I know that. Okay, that's just stupid to, to assume that everybody who has AIDS, you know, deserves it or some nonsense like that. Um, you know, for instance, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, children. Uh, born with AIDS because their parents had AIDS and just you know transferred over to them, or some people get AIDS through different means that that, that you know um, being with someone else or whatever, um, and so it's not necessarily always sin that brings about AIDS, but um, you know if people wouldn't sleep around for a few generations, AIDS would die off with the people. Is what I was saying. Um, now obviously that would demand a lot of sacrifice. People couldn't. Um, well, they'd have to be alone, it, you know, it'd be a hard life, but ultimately the sin would be eradicated. So an outline of, of numbers, they're still at, at Sinai at the beginning, where they were all through the end of Exodus, all the way through Leviticus, and now into Numbers. Um, and, and they don't leave Sinai until about 1010, which means that Numbers starts up with legal material. So the legal material goes from midway through Exodus somewhere to, you know, Numbers 10. I mean, that's a good chunk of it, and so there is clearly a unifying factor. And so it's important to notice that Genesis through Deuteronomy is one unit called the Pentateuch. It is one, definitely one section. It's to be understood together, not as separate entities. And a lot of the themes will transfer over throughout the different, the different books. So from Sinai to Edom is from 10, chapter 10 through 20 where they have the, the, the spies sent out, um, and of those, only two of the spies give a good report all the other ones uh, give give a bad give a bad report, um, and um, so as a result, the only, only those two spies are the only ones who left to enter into the uh, promised land um, in the book of Joshua. So, um, from Edom to the Jordan in chapter twenty through thirty six, um, and and this is where the events of Balaam happen. Um, if you want to read more about that, chapter 25, uh, 1 through 9 says about that. Um, and uh, while they're, for this, they're just kind of waiting there for a good part of it, and they start sleeping around with the people of Edom. And um, uh, it seems as though this was uh, Balaam's idea. You know, he interbreed with them. Um, and, and Balaam, it seems, was just a random seer. He was not a man of God. Um, I don't really want to elaborate too much on that. But Balaam is definitely not an image of how we should live our lives, um, as he, you know, tested God and, and and advised the people of how to test the people of Israel, and, and did try to, did definitely try to mislead the people. Um, you know, and did it for money. Um, definitely not something we want to emulate in our lives. Um, and God went to extremes to stop to, to, to prevent him from from you know cursing the people. Um, basically, we see that we see God affirming this promise, and all throughout the five books of, of the Pentateuch, God it, things coming up and, and threatening. Oh no, is the promise going to be broken? And God reaffirming the promise. So Numbers is a book, uh, and I know a lot of people don't 
understand the theme of Numbers, that's because Numbers is a book of the holy and the profane. Uh, the blessings of the numbers versus the plagues. See what I mean? Whereas in Exodus, Egypt was getting the plagues. Now they're getting the plagues. So it has just this, this strong contrast between what the rewards of the righteous and the rewards of, of, the, of the wicked. Just constantly, you know, going back between, back and forth between what people earn for themselves, basically. Um, hmm. So. Um, how the how the when the people are sleeping around there's this there's this plague and um, one of the leaders stabs one of the men through with the spear and it goes through him and into the woman um, and and with that the plague is, is stopped but um, that's recorded in 25 one through nine um, so number shows the consequences of disobedience Leviticus gave us the how numbers shows us what happens if you don't um, so we'll go over this one last thing here. Uh, actually, we won't. Um, the next, with the next lesson, I'll talk about um, Deuteronomy and Joshua and Ruth, and probably Judges. Um, probably talk about all four of those, and we'll also talk about how many um, were of the people of Israel. Um, so once again, just kind of shooting through a lot of this stuff. Um, but it's important to note that you know, with Balaam, going back to this. First off, we 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 question the thing about how, you know, he asks God and God says no, don't go with them, and then he asks again and God says yes, but then God is angry for him for go with them for going, and a lot of people have formulated a lot of different ideas, um, but what is important to note is that once again, let God be God. God acts in a way that we don't always understand. Second off. Um, that we shouldn't emulate this. You don't just keep asking God for something until He says yes, and then you lead yourself into temptation or something. You know, uh, that's not really the point here. Uh, also, um, it is important to note that Balaam was not a man of God, and so he acted according to how you would not expect a man of God to act. Uh, if God tells you no, it's probably best to just leave it at that. Um, but then also, uh, it's important to note that this is really an extreme example. Um, this is the only example that we have of this happening. Um, you know, with God saying no, then yes, and then getting angry. Well, not the only, but I mean, one of the only. Um, and, and then with the, uh, um, with the donkey speaking and all this. These are a bunch of extremes that, that we really don't have. And then even this unrighteous man, you know, is, is moved on and, and he, and he says, says these blessings to, to the children of Israel. You know, and, and so it's important to note that you know God can God can literally use anything, um, and don't build doctrine off of, of off of vague verses. Um, I'm not going to elaborate too much on that, um, as you can do your own study and draw your own conclusions. This is just a really brief uh, course um, on understanding the Old Testament. So, um, I hope that it was it was informational for you that you kind of understand where we're going. Um, and we'll talk about how the laws apply to us in a future lesson.